Hello everyone, today we talk about the artistical renaissance between the 15th and the 16th century. Um, we addressed uh, a couple of times, I think, um, history of uh, Renaissance art and uh, some other time in the Renaissance uh, in general, and you know that my overall comment as a medievalist is, you know, cannot be entirely flattery, but of course the Renaissance as any you know, broader cultural and historical phenomenon has its pros and cons. And today we definitely look at some of the best realizations of it, right? Really what makes you reconsider why and how, you know, the this phase in, in Western history had this great confidence, definitely, in humanity. It was essentially opening to, uh, ideally, to, to, to a brighter future, right? That the Renaissance expectations were, were crushed miserably like the 16th century eventually was one of the most single most traumatic brutal and 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 dark centuries in in European history like there was a sense of uh, disorientation that stemmed from from the tragedies of, of of those years that would never be recovered up to essentially the, the scientific revolution you know rationalism um, in in the in second half 17th century um, and yet this this part of history is naturally produced um, in its blooming phase but between in fact the, the, the late uh, 15 to second half of 15 to the first half of the 16th century properly uh, what can be considered uh, in artistical terms but really as some of the major pillars in not just western but in global civilization like the art the single Art in terms of, of, of sheer and pure and absolute and essential uh, and uh, universal beauty, right? That that Renaissance art produces is something that you 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 cannot find by definition in any other um, moment in history, if not you know through other criteria fundamentally. But this is truly um, an aspect of of our history that is often confined just to the. Art you know, uh, just the artistical side of the story, but this beauty is more, uh, is way more than that. It's it's literally the, the new vision of the world, right? Strongly and truly humanistic, in, as we understand, and that is not characterized by, you know, uh, the mere look of it, right? You know, art uh, derives from the Latin arts and the practice, that ars artis, that is properly the applicated the technical applications in many ways, right? Art has a theoretical side and a practical side, and that obviously meet and intertwine, um, and that are both product of a civilization, of a world that must be understood, in fact, you know, in a Renaissance perspective as, you know, not, you know, the, the world waking up from, from centuries of the darkness as, by the way, the same humanists mm, trick still many people <laughs> in popular culture to, to believe, right? Uh, Renaissance is properly and specifically and exactly a product of medieval civilization that, you know, stemmed a gent from, um, you know, this um, extremely dynamic and effervescent and varied and deep and poetical, right, and really artistical base that um, me medieval, uh, medieval civilization was able to produce this through certain very specific political and social um, realities that have to do with... Uh, um, uh, humanism wouldn't exist properly without an elitistic view, right? An aristocratic, oligarchic ideal that is the one that is forming even in those republics that we'll see today. There are, yes, there are republics, but fundamentally there are oligarchies that share some of, you know, the most mm, um, aristocratic um, uh, tastes as, as up to the point of royalty. Right, and the same goes with feudal culture, with the principalities in Europe. Right, there, there is properly an elitistic aristocratic culture that is shared both by the feudal monarchies, uh, the feudal nobility, and the um, republican, the communal oligarchies, and the seigneuries of Italy. That today we will fundamentally be addressing. That is not to say that, of course, the Renaissance was just uh, an Italian phenomenon. Actually, we haven't expanded enough. On this, <coughs> on this side of the story, because properly, the, uh, you know, the Renaissance 
uh, is born in Italy. No, and this, there is no doubt, right? And it spread in, in many ways um, from there so to other countries. There is literally a different timing, right? You know, consider, I don't know, when, when Renaissance, just from chronologically speaking, it, it's thought to, to, to have happened in England, for example, that is essentially during the Tudor age, Tudor year. Um, in Italy, the thing begins much, much before, right? Uh, even up in, in from the, the, the first half of, of the 14th century, even in pre-humanistic sense, um, and then blossoming, however, uh, mostly in the, in the 15th, as we know. And in this mm, dramatic phase, that is naturally also the, you know, the, the period across the, the 15th and the 16th century, that is marked by you know this extreme opulence and intellectual fervor and technical advancement of um, of Italy properly uh, uh, as a system, especially one of the signories. Um, that, however, enters in crisis exactly at that point with wars of Italy, where, with the French uh, invasion, and eventually you know all the, the this major conflict that goes on for for generations uh, across Europe. Eventually, will shift more to, towards the north, but that that started from a reality that paradoxically had produced this immense, 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 here if we were to just, you know, quantify the sheer amount of uh, cultural legacy that is being produced here, like in, in terms of world heritage and in Italy during these decades, but even, you know, in other times, but specifically concentrating here Literally, there is no price, there is no quantity, there is no way of putting a boundary and saying, you know, here we can more or less equate it to something. This is literally, it had never been seen before in the history of human civilization. Um, and yet, this political crisis, this fragmentation, this uh, permanent state of Italy as, you know, in fact, a rich yet politically fragmented place that is the best target for every, you know, in invading um, army that, however, you know, um, eventually was obliged fundamentally to share the government of, of the newly conquered lands with the local oligarchies because that was the only way still uh, to, to dominate this region as it was simply too 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 overpopulated and too per capita um, wealth rich to, to just say okay we'll we'll rule here with iron fist so um, and this this is also what channeled in fact the the expansion of Italian Renaissance, Italian art, and he, here we're talking about literally every single field of, 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 of knowledge at the time. Like early uh, modern European culture is Italian on every field, technology, science, literature, um, you know, architecture, uh, technology, it, it, it starts from there. Think about Francis I of Valois that considered literally from this, you know, enormous uh, land of France that was firmly now uh, after the hundred years war framed under the control of a uh, of a unitary monarchy and a true state as a matter of fact a truer state in, in this sense it's very interesting to look at the french and italian um a dialogue about what what is what should be the 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 legitimate form of government right you know from, from one side you have something close that is well had in, in a few centuries towards absolute monarchy and from the other side this you know, fiction of democracy that, of course, um, Renaissance Italy w was not uh, by the slightest, but that still had a, a very different vision of power, etc. Well, Francis of Valois, aside from, you know, of course, speaking Italian and having, you know, uh, an enormous, um, you know, fascination for everything coming from the peninsula, considered legitimately, you know, the uh, the Italian Peninsula, just as an extension of France, right? You, this is very French, like the idea that, after all, a unified France, historically speaking, is always, you know, trying to, to invade the uh, either Germany or Italy, because these start to be properly the, the lands of the Holy Roman Empire as the so-called, in, in the modern age, the, the weak areas of Europe, right? The areas that are, in fact, more politically fragmented, that are um, more permeable, right to to invasion and in fact it will become the, the battlefields of europe I in many ways italy uh flanders germany right Th this will um eventually have a, a peculiar um, um you know political and institutional um development but different from 
north and the south of the Alps, but definitely having to do, having to cope with this reality of major principalities and kingdoms, you know, that were coming at the end of the Middle Ages to this sound political unity and, and these local areas being fundamentally divided, right? And actually, Italy was, 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 let's say, not close to, to achieve something similar because there was no sign of that, but, you know, at least there were regional states in this regard. Look, North of the Alps of the Empire, the Germany, did it's like there were like 300 principalities here. We're, we're in Italy, were like one tent. Um, and and this is, however, important to understand also why and how uh, these regions were so uh, fervent from a scientific point of view. Because in this phase, Italy, Germany do not have uh, properly a, a technically they are two kingdoms by the way, uh, within the Holy Roman Empire. But of course, they have nothing like that for real. Um, and yet, they are probably these two countries the most technologically advanced in Europe as well. So this speaks actually for uh, you know a, a, um, an aspect of Western history that has to do with the, the idea of how beneficial actually this more federative, federal, if you want, uh, asset had for the same... Um, boosting of the, uh, you know, intellectual, of science, of technology, and it, believe me, that has a, a great deal to do with it, right? And today we will take a look fundamentally at Italy and at some of its major artists, but also at some of the major centers of, you know, of power and realizing why uh, there was this uh, blooming of, uh, you know, uh, of, of, of minds. So we, we cannot think that, you know, um, that there weren't other Michelangelo's, for example, I don't know, in Spain, in Scandinavia, or, or or in Britain, or in Poland, like, you know, but the, the reason why Michelangelo became the one w w was definitely had a lot to do with what Italy concretely was from a political and social institutional point of view in here. And the relation between naturally and centrally between the, the monarch, the, the autocrat, and the um, and the artist, right, at, at several levels, and many branches of art and other, you know, intellectual fields in gen more, bro more broad. So, today we talk mostly about the figurative arts, so we're talking about painting, drawing, architecture, sculpture, um, uh, that the renewal brought to an evident break um, relatively to the previous tradition, right, and giving life to essentially a new uh, expressive language, right? The the let's say the elements, the 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 ingredients for it had existed at this point since quite a while, right? You know that this pre-humanistic flavor can be spotted already by the end of the 13th century, in many ways. Some say even you know the the court, the Sicilian court of Frederick II of Orangestaufen spread this um, you know this literally. Uh, taste and eventually will influence as you know main figures like Dante for example or Petrarca that in fact is the, the latter being considered as Dante the last of the medieval universalists uh, Petrarch like the, the the first of the of the true humanists right and in, in and it is spot on as an ideal but you know Petrarch didn't realize exactly what um, you know that that would have become, but surely uh, his expectations in many ways were fulfilled so, so at the point that even as a, as a founder he was naturally surpassed in, in many models, many ways. Um, even the, there is a way, literally, of, uh, you know, even of starting to write, for example, in a different way, right? Um, there is the idea that in a way or in another everything has to be redrawn on the base of the, the classical past right on on latin on greek 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 had been uh, lost fundamentally uh, in in europe uh, during uh, the the middle ages um the first true uh, i mean there was surely someone of course that you know uh, you know had aside from i don't know byzantines traveling in the west and especially after the fall of constantinople all of the, the refugees that were very often very, very highly educated people who brought together with them all their manuscripts and stuff uh, there was some Western European who spoke Greek, etc. But even in here, the, the very first and you know uh, Greek lessons that were taught were in Florence during the, the mid 14th century by Boccaccio. By the way, that is you know in the Triad of Dante and Petrarch, they 
you know, the true beginner, this new, um, you know, approach, if you want to, to knowledge in many ways, and to the, to the latter, to the, Boccaccio was a great philologist, a great linguist, and um, this has a lot to do with properly what the Renaissance will become, that is, look at the um, tradition of Erasmus, for example, um, or a Shakespeare, or Cervantes, or Ariosto, I mean, all these, you know, true pillars of, of, of Western literature by definition that every single Westerner should know by heart, you know, <laughs> to really be defined as such, um, and that, you know, there was probably a shared uh, past that was something that really made the, the West as, as we know it, that is an idea that is taking root but is being rationalized properly at this point, right, that is, this is naturally controversial, but that indeed has in the historical, you know, think about, you know, having had a xenophone, having had uh, an Herodotus even before uh, a Thucydides, uh, that really made a difference. Like, I don't know, in China, w there wasn't that way of making history, it wasn't that make of saying, you know, let's try to reconstruct the facts and not just to, to adapt uh, a narrative on the base of a pre, you know, arranged ideal view of the universe that is symbolized, you know, by the and um, this has a lot to do with even that with that political fragmentation we're saying before, because this is a bit maybe one of those factors. It was asked recently, you know, this huge question is, you know, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I don't answer because in the comments I, I often don't have now the time because they're starting to grow um, to to actually answer everybody. But, you know, what is that made the West the West, right? You know, and I, I have problems with the question because naturally, which is legitimate, of course, and that I naturally understand. But, the, the, you know, if you really want to answer that seriously, you have to take into account, first of all, what is the f the West first, right? And it, I don't have a clear answer. I mean, I, I could... Now, we will not absolutely digress into the discussion, but, you know, if we were to find at least one of the major elements into this, there is the, um, the idea that, after all... Uh, uh, Europe has been a, a set of different cultures that definitely had something in common. Exactly in this fragmentation, I mean, exactly in this almost quasi-tribal, uh, if you want, and, um, you know, federal asset that survived up to the, basically after the French Revolution, up to the idea of the nation-state, that is great, this great flatter, this um, flatter, uh, yeah, flatter sounds bad, but you know, English, but you know, uh, this great uh, homogenizer that, you know, I can't say took over any, you know, element that belonged to the Ancien Regime, but um, that somewhat changed the view of what, you know, that secularized deeply our way of thinking, and that, that wasn't really the, the thing that made what we had been in the past, like the, this idea of the diversity of European culture within itself and its ability in fact to have a dialogue and not to you know stagnate um, within itself it, it's an enormous deal and has really a lot to do with even what in this period um, the Renaissance really has been right the Renaissance couldn't be born in 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 different eras from from in fact the specific regions of, of Western Europe in many ways uh, because simply in other the, there wasn't the, the the social fabric for the, the political balance the, the economical you know availability to, to render it possible so this must be truly understood and it, it has to be acknowledged naturally all what you know other renaissances actually in western history had had been about we can talk about the carolingian one that truly from a cultural point of view was was a concrete legacy the 12th century renaissance that had already structured on this you know, Western area of Europe, this Atlantic and Western Mediterranean area, really um, a common language, a common way of, you know, of codifying information, of uh, a shared um, system of references in, in many ways. And there were many gluing factors, uh, like the, for example, the, the use of the of, of Latin as, as a as a uniform, like, uh, official language, the, um, you know, the, the, even the codicological, you know, a, a substantial technological homogeneity of Europe, a material culture of Europe, uh, in spite of the differences, for example, between North and South, or just West and East, um, 
and uh, uh, a common way of also considering society that is often considered as chaotic compared to the, the, the modern state or more properly the, the contemporary state but it actually was a, a much more gluing factor after all uh, on the base that we all ha shared somewhat a, a uniqueness a freedom a, um, um, a privilege that, that defined uh, in turn our own quality our own identity our own way of relating to each other in a in a shared system. Now this is a very vague explanation as you understand it. I, these are still things that I have to sort out myself to you know to, to be presented maybe in another video dedicated on it. But um, when we look at the, at the you know at Renaissance art uh, sticking to it, um, we, we observe really um, a technique like an interest in applying the the information on if you want on an innovative base right was the uh, of the 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 always the coexistence in renaissance art between old and new right uh, man and nature right something that is really the base for a universal language right that, that definitely the renaissance was not um even if you know it was developing this kind of elitary and posh attitudes towards other areas in history, was definitely not a self-referential uh, reality. Um, it, it 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 began, of course, like many movements, to to define itself in, in a bit you know kind of a categorical sense, but um, and assuming certain attitudes once again towards uh, certain other phases. But it, the idea is that here. Europe is at, at the research properly of a of a fundamental truth. Like that this is something that will never be abandoned fundamentally, and it's it's even the seed for the 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 scientific revolution in itself. For this continuous research for a stable point that actually the crisis of the 16th century um, will will trigger further. Think about Baroque art. That is another massive chapter of you know civilization accomplishment well that starts at fundamentally from the the lack of a bay of a center the idea that the mankind fi finds all of a sudden itself as without a, a true center of reference think about the uh, the, the the you know the invention of the allocentric theory uh, the uh, th this idea that there wasn't just the old world out there was something else that the, the break of the of the religious unity of Europe with the Reformation, so uh, a world now that had to give itself new bases, right? But also looking at the past, looking at the authority, look at models that, according to the Renaissance, had been working and that they wanted, you know, the this the side of, you know, maybe the sterile aspect of Renaissance apparently that is ju just to try to copy the past and trying to in the classical past to apply it to reality, right? And the, the, the Renaissance produce some astonishing fiascos in this regard uh, at many levels today you know tomorrow actually we'll talk for example about that in, in the military field um, just during the French army during the wars of Italy for example um, but uh, the imitation of the Roman legions by by Francis the first of France um, but um, that's probably the uh, instead the, the sap of that I mean the experimentalism the idea of trying something new whether it works trying to find it a you know a, an axiom a sort of law something that that uh, it lays at the basis of of the universe that that is intelligible and this is how fundamentally intellectuals in, in, um, at least this elitistic intellectuals in many way they're the word true product of humanism and the renaissance try to sort to frame to sort out the, the, the reality up to in fact the end of the the 17th century Right where things began to change, literally just at the structural level in the fabric of society, where the society wasn't being elitistic anymore. The, the middle classes were beginning to rise once again, um, and the Renaissance started began with fundamentally with the study of the ancient manifests, right of the classical treatises, and it translated itself in a sort of more um, realistic representation of the universe that in art was reflected uh, you know in this definitely more 
more uh, realistic view of, of, of landscapes, for example, and of nature in general. And here, behind some of the greatest masterpieces um, of, of Renaissance painting, you, you see the, 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 the scientific effort there, right? Trying to represent the depth of the landscape, the, uh, even the atmospherical, um, the um, you know the the, the optical uh, distortions of you know the atmosphere the light of the weather you know that that was a thing was very being pioneer pioneered at the time and and beyond this beautiful soft ideal forms of of, of nature and you know, there is always a um, a geometrical element behind that that is substantiated and that's the view of Renaissance that is starting to give a backbone to the understanding of reality as such right even sometimes in a very crude way right you you can't um you can't uh, help to, to to see behind the i don't know some of leonardo's uh you know portraits or you know drawings of, of animals of nature etc the the fact the, the autopsies for example that he carried out to to really understand the, the anatomy of, of, of the living beings of this really this uh, literal uh in curiosity for the dissection of reality and, and that's i would say that's the true you know sap in many ways of of, of the renaissance that the true good part of it. it was even illegal think about the dissection of corpses was was prohibited by the church because of the resurrection and of the body and all this stuff in but um still this happened still the curiosity the need to the, the progress even in medicine of course in all these fields passed through that and this is very very important and um and even generous as a at a portrait that up to that time had been somewhat conventional now began to confer more attention to the physical and anatomical aspects but at the same time also to the emotional and psychological ones right at, at the time of the renaissance the major scientific or pseudo scientific theories were were still very primitive in a way like um the the doctors the scientists believe still you know that fundamentally it was all about uh, with astrology with the various humors you know with, within the body you know all, all these things that actually were somewhat quite theoretical like an uh, um there is probably two levels of, of renaissance science and technology that that are you know from at the top what we often see more because it was more funded as we will see in a while uh, the the elitistic like you know the the theoretical um and more official even uh side of science the one of 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 doctors for example that at the time didn't touch a patient right uh barbers or you know uh, midwives were often way more competent in their respective fields of properly of medicine if, if even if it wasn't considered at the time like that than the same doctors right because they had the true uh, practice of, of of the of the craft um, so that's probably the second level like the idea that behind uh, Michelangelo or uh, Leonardo there, there was a, a world of practitioners of of technicians of, of mechanics of people that really were the same ones that were erected now the, the, the major fortresses all over Europe um, they were casting guns they were uh, building um, aqueducts uh, that that were l literally expanding the 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 practicality of reality that unfortunately has not been um, it's not arrived as documented as this um, you know uh, elite uh, artistical visual uh, reality that we're more acquainted with when we talk about the Renaissance right and that mostly stemmed from a in fact for a narrow a base from a narrow reality that is the one of the courts of the intellectual of court that is, is not a free thinker is not a you know much even a practitioner in 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 um, you know in, in line of principle but is, is someone who has to present something that that works and that is to be employed by the same uh, by the same lords right it is not that these you know figures didn't practice that they actually did but what we know about that face is much less than we we know about the product that they actually brought and and this expansion of of knowledge is uh, you know ex 
arrives to, to fields also to teams that are, are different from the usuals, right? For example, the sacred ones that, that were typical of previous art, right? And you, we start seeing a sort of naturally being inspired by a classical legacy, a sort of even a pagan, uh, you know, uh, revival, uh, we can say, that, that it was even very pushed, like, uh, even look at the papacy, look at Leo the Tent, for example, look at how ambiguous even, you know, the the political institutional uh, symbolisms and, and, you know, tastes were in terms of, you know, there was a, a, an enormous amount of paganism in, you know, the, the papal symbology, for example, in those very times. It was a, a provocation, like it's not that these were less Christian um, individuals than before, right? Maybe they were even more, in, in, in a sense, because they, they were starting to understand better even the same scriptures, even the same uh, philology of, of, of the Bible and the exegesis uh, attached to it. But at the same time, they were they were trying to expand, they were trying to go beyond, they were trying to um, bring in something that could fit, after all, that could try to to overla overlap with what the the official um, uh, the official authority really wanted, that were the same people telling the truth at that point, um, what allowed to, you know, to, to, uh, to be acceptable. Um, and you start f finding, for example, these beautiful uh, and enormous paintings of the great battles, right? You start seeing uh, depictions even of heroes that are not just the ones of Christianity, but maybe of even of Islam or the pagan past. Um, uh, I don't know, Saladin, think about the, the novelists, uh, you know, the novels that spread on Saladin d during the late Middle Ages in Europe I mean, were enormous. And the, the, the Assyro-Babylonian kings, all these... Um, the reality is that, that appear because people began truly to read and try to even you know, approach a tr truly historiographic, scientifically historiographical um, perspective to it, to start realizing wh what is the history of the world, right? Um, wh wh where did, did this all begin and how, right? It's not that the Middle Ages hadn't produced that because, you know, the Universal Chronicle is a typical medieval genre, but in fact, now, there, there, there is a, a much deeper uh, insight uh, in this, in, in, in the capacity, not just of collecting sources and of framing them, but probably of, of connecting um, them, the one with the art. And in visual arts, uh, it was definitely the discovery of linear perspective, where the elements composed, pictured, uh, and are predisposed within an orderly ordered system of lines that converge towards a single vanishing point, right? And this really gave a, a truly scientific realism to perspective and proportions, right? It, it surpassed in many ways the bidimensional space that had been somewhat typical of previous art, right? You can go uh, back as far as Giotto, right? In, for the early 14th century, even there you see where the, the thing began for real. So never think once again that the Renaissance is truly like for a moment, but the, the Renaissance began and what what existed before was you know was was detached from it. Right? It, it it didn't happen like that. The the Renaissance is a consequence of what existed before. Right? It's the fruit of what the of the previous exploit. Right? And uh, the previous space, however, had naturally um, flattened the representation and had separated it from the observer, right? It was simply a different system that required that because the the world was different in many ways. The, the people had a different approach even to art, to visual art and so on. And at this point it's, uh, you know, perspective gave concreteness to the idea of the centrality of mankind within nature. And this is typical of humanistic studies, and introduced the subjective point of view of the observer, associating it to a vision of reality that is anchored to rational rules. This is extremely important. In here, there is all the confidence of the uh, of the modern man now to to say, not only I, you know, I I, I can evaluate my subjective. Uh, point of view, but I can frame it at the same time within an objective one, right? And this is not a small uh, achievement. This is an enormous acknowledgement that um, 
you know, in previous times had proceeded through a much more empirical way, right? And this is really about framing the whole reality within a rational view. And uh, rational, not in the sense that, you know, these people didn't stop believing in irrational things or that, you know, we, we, we do now, for example, uh, instead. Uh, but that the, the world ha was intelligible, that the limits that uh, were posed to reality were um, um, apparently posed to reality could be surpassed, and, and which was not a, a much of a positive um, acknowledgement, because the, the previous civilization had rested on the, if you want, the safety of the existence of those boundaries. Nobody had really cared whether they were permeable or not. Everybody was content with that. At this point, uh, the Europeans are forced to acknowledge it, right? They are, they are forced to realize that, for example, the church at this point was not a single one anymore. That there was a, a split within the same Christianity. That was the single major tragedy in the history of Western, um, uh, you know, uh, modern history. It was not uh, the wars that ravaged the continent in an unprecedented scale it was not the discovery of the Americas and the fact that you know the, the, the you know the biblical set of peoples now had to be readjusted in a way. It was literally about the fact that the unity of the church had been broken, right? And 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 this is something that uh, uh, you know brought brought forcefully people to try to find a new base, right? Just think about. The parallelisms that happen here, the, the creation of, the, for example, the, the modern state, right? That was enforced by the sheer necessity of, of politics and of warfare. The fact that now you couldn't simply maintain the, this cluster of, of seigneuries where, you know, that, that could defend it, the each other simply with their castles. Now, no, artillery arrives, you know, castles are crushed to the ground. Um, it, uh, a state is is needed to start building, you know, first of all, fielding other artillery and and you know professional troops on larger scale and building much larger uh, fortifications and infrastructures. So this is all something that doesn't happen because you know there was a positive growth about it, but because people were pressured to do it uh, at the cost of being uh, annihilated. Um, and uh, think about the Ottoman advance, another major factor in here that, you know, uh, up to the, you know, the, 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 the fall of Constantinople, the same West had not much paid, paid attention to. We made a lot of videos about that, explaining how, anyway, they, they weren't maybe so even wrong about it, because, the, the, you know, the, the, the thing was unpredictable in many ways, but still, you know, when the, the the Turks began to swarm across the Balkans, uh, arrived at the gates of, of Vienna in, in, in the 20s of the 16th century, well, the thing began to, to be very, very troubled in that regard, from not talking about the Mediterranean now, and this major, I mean, the boundaries even meant, geographically speaking, finding a new way for the for the East, realizing that, you know, the, now the, the world, you know, the, the Indies could be reached from the other side, uh, Columbus died without knowing that he had discovered a new continent. Um, he and we we should abandon even the, the preconceptions about the uh, you know how uh, about the alleged back backwardness of the capabilities of these people. I mean, for example, it's a myth that people believed that the Earth was flat right at at the time. Um, it, it is a myth that um, you know the the, the papacy was particularly close to scientific inquiry or that, I don't know. The Inquisition was, was really a, you know, unjust, a sadistic thing. It was actually one of the most, the, probably the single most guarantistic tribunal in, in, in Europe, but where the secular justice was something extremely brutal and very, very unjust in many ways. Um, and uh, we're talking about a world that has the means, finally, to experiment new resources. Uh, the beginnings of the Renaissance can be definitely observed, artistically speaking, in the work of some Florentines of the first decades of the 15th century. We're talking about, uh, for example, Masaccio died in 1428, the architect Filippo Brunelleschi uh, 1446, and the sculptor Donatello 1466, um, uh, that were 
heads of schools, uh, fundamentally, that traced the guidelines of the renewal that would have gradually reached all over Europe, right? That that's the, the standing point. Masaccio uh, was named was nickname actually he he was name was Tommaso di, di Ser Giovanni di Mone Cassai, right? Um, and uh, he was from the Arno Valley and as we see, he was a painter and uh, properly one of the beginners of the Renaissance in Florence, renewing picture according to uh, a, now a, a new rigorous vision that refused, for example, the uh, decorational uh, excesses or the artificiality of the style that was dominating. Like, you know, art had increased most of this um, wealth of it rather than its, you know, representative capabilities in, at some point. Um, it is proper of the the, the international Gothic um, uh, in the previous times and he actually started and Masaccio started from the volumetric synthesis of Giotto that as we've seen had fundamentally began the the perspective and also um, rereading it through the as we'll see now the perspective construction by Brunelleschi and also the the plastic force of Donatello's statues, right? And he inserted these um, beautiful figures with, you know, with a very marked sense of realism, really, of, of the pictures in, um, in uh, architectures and uh, realistic, plausible landscapes now that modeling them, for example, through the chiaroscuro technique, right? And um, he he's continued in many, uh, he's believed to have continued in many ways uh, Giotto's work properly. Filippo Brunelleschi uh, extended Filippo di Ser Brunellesco Lapi was a Florentine architect, engineer, sculptor, mathematician, goldsmith, um, and even a sonographer. These were all polymaths. This is the, the polymath is probably the, the model of the Renaissance uh, thinker, scholar. Uh, artists in many ways. These people were able to do everything practical. That's where the, the true, uh, the truly artistical, etymologically speaking, meaning of these people emerges. Like the genius proper, this capacity of, of dealing with everything material uh, in this regard. And Brunelleschi is considered the first engineer and, you know, projector of the modern age, right? Brunelleschi was, as we have seen, one of the three great initiators of the Florentine Renaissance with Donatello and Masaccio. And in particular, he was the older one, right? He was the point of reference in many ways for the other two. And uh, um, we owe to him properly the invention of, of perspective with the, uh, uh, as we have seen, the, the single banishing point, right? Or also known as um, central linear perspective. Right, and he had uh, as many, you know, artists at the time an apprenticeship uh, as goldsmith, for example, in a career as sculptor. And however, he dedicated himself prevalently to architecture, building almost completely uh, in Florence, um, both um, you know lay, fundamentally secular, and religious buildings that would become the major point of reference for Renaissance architecture. And definitely among his greatest achievements, if not the greatest achievement, uh, telling the truth, there is the dome of the Florence Cathedral, right? Uh, an engin engineering masterpiece that was uh, built without the help of the traditional techniques, uh, such as the Centina, for example. And, and um, that that that's utterly incredible. We will see it better later how he did. It. Basically, superimposed two domes to make a larger one. Uh, astonishing, and also this had a lot of because of classical legacy, but it was sensibly improved. Um, and with Brunelleschi was also born, uh, together with him, the figure of the modern architect. That aside from being, you know, just committed in the tactical operational processes such as the. Um, court masters by right, the medieval times he also had um, this m substantial and aware 
role in the projectile phase, as we've seen, right? That there is not just um, anymore a merely mechanic art, right? But there is a, an intellectual side of, of the of the theorist that practices a liberal art founded on, on mathematics and geometry, right? And even history, because as we've seen, there was a substantial uh, knowledge, you know, even of ancient architecture uh, and more, right? And what really, you know, that thing in the past had meant for the people of the time. And Brunelleschi architecture was characterized for the realization of monumental works and of very defined cl clearness, uh, you know, properly from, from a methodological and technical point of view, um, built starting from uh, a, a basic model, essentially, that uh, corresponded to integral numbers uh, and expressed in uh, Florentine arms. So it was a unit of measure from which were derived multiples and under multiples, sub-multiples, basically, to um, draw from it the proportions of an, an in, the entire building, right? Um, we know that this was done also in previous times, but in here we have now a full, um, you know, explanation of the thing and the, the actual evidence and the actual arrangement, right? That was regularized, right? Um, he imitated um, the, um, you know, the uh, classical architectonic orders, for example, the full arc um, and uh, 180 degrees. It was indispensable to rationalize uh, ge geometrically and mathematically the, the plans and the properly the, the, the prospects, right, of our representation of, of, of an object, uh, graphically speaking. And a, a distinctive tract of his work is also the purity of forms, right? Uh, that has uh, um, functionalization also of the decorative elements in within the, the the entire structures, and typical in this sense was the the employment of certain material like the um, uh, see the the gray pietra serena as it was called for the um, the the, the architecture of fillings that were also result you know was was uh, was evident on the uh, brighter cover of the of the walls. Um, there was all a uh, now the uh, technicalities that now I'm not particularly competent on, but some we could look at another time. A passing to Donatello actually, his name being Donato di Niccolo di Beto Bardi, was another fl uh, Florentine sculptor, painter, and architect, right? And he had an extremely long career. Right. He also lived uh, for long for, for those time, 80 years, and he is considered one of the three fathers of the Florentine Renaissance, as we've seen, together with Brunelleschi and Masaccio. Uh, besides, uh, one of the greatest and most famous sculptors of all times, right? he gave this fundamental contribution to the renewal of the sculpturing methods, uh, abandoning De definitely the experiences of the late Gothic art, and he surpassed um, as well the uh, the same models of classical Roman art. Uh, he uh, invented a, a new style, right? That um, basically uh, was based on a relief with minimal um, variations uh, compared to the, the 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 background, right? That um, we're talking about millimeters of, of, of thickness, right? That, um, however, was able to uh, create this illusory space and therefore pioneered uh, through this the, the most um, varied uh, techniques and materials, such as marbles, the pietra serena that we've seen before, bronze, wood, terracotta, right? And he also dedicated to painting, right? Providing models. Uh, for example, for some of the stained glass of the Florence Cathedral, and uh, his capacity to infuse a humanity and psychological introspections to these works is, is very, very important, right? He very often gave even this dramatic or energic and vital, um, you know, 
characters that were perfectly visible, immediately visible in this regard. And it was based naturally, as we've seen before, on, on this duplicity of, let's say, of, of physics and, and psychology that starts emerging from, from this approach to, to art. Um, and the flourishing of Renaissance, as we've seen, is fundamentally located across, uh, across the, you know, the, the, the 15th and the 16th century. A time in which in various cities worked contemporarily um, some of the greatest artists easily of all times, right? You know, think about um, Bramante um, or Leonardo da Vinci in Milan, um, uh, Raffaello Sanzio in Urbino, uh, in, in, um, in the Venetian uh, region Giorgione or Vittorio Carpaccio, Lorenzo Lotto and Tiziano Vecelli in uh, this for northern Italy uh, in general just start looking at them briefly you know Bramante is an extremely famous uh, 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 architect and, and painter right uh, his name was Donato Donnino it was a nickname the Angelo di Pascuccio known as the Bramante um, and uh, he, he was born in, in the marches but uh, he also worked consistently he, first in Milan, then in Rome, right? And he was one of the major artists of, of the Renaissance. He studied in Urbino properly, that, you know, was the seat of the, uh, one of the Montefeltro uh, seniors, one of the most prolific in, in artistical, literary terms, uh, one of the most important centers of, 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 of the Renaissance. And as we have seen, Bramante was active first in Milan, that was the, b at least before the, the wars of Italy, but with some continuity also later on, the, the most properly statal entity in the among the Italian signories was a, a very kind of still military oriented, was a military power of to, to be reckoned uh, to recon um, with and not invested a lot in fact in fortifications in guns. So that's also where where Leonardo was was active for this force. Uh, eventually, these were all lands connected to the rest of Europe with France with you know with, with other uh, you know with all the intrigue of the, the, of the international policy that maybe we'll, uh, we'll have to make a video on the on, on the wars of Italy at this point um, and he conditioned of course positively the Lombard Renaissance eventually he moved to Rome uh, where he actually projected nonetheless that St. Peter's Basilica Right, and as an architect, uh, he was the personality of greater uh, relevance, we could say, uh, between the, the 15th and the 16th century. Um, I mean, in those specific years of transition, in and, and also in maturing um, the properly the, the 16th century classicism so much that his work is often compared by the contemporaries themselves to start looking at. We'll see Vasari later on, or uh, Leon Battista Albert um, to um, let's say uh, the, uh, to architecture of the Roman uh, of the Roman ruins, right? That were serving as a model, right? Consider here, you know, Italy has a lot of stuff that that, that is still in the open, and and the Renaissance actually was was a terrible time for for the, the Roman ruins because many of these great families actually drew an enormous amount of marbles to build their own palaces and churches, etc. And th these, the humanists were starting, to, like, for example, think about Raphael, to, to start saying, wait, wait a second, we have to preserve this uh, legacy. Like th today, we we know what cultural legacy, what, you know, uh, the word heritage is about. Well, when was it born, this city? Well, exactly in these times and places, because it was starting to be recognized that these ruins were very important, were part of a broader shared memory, could inspire, could teach, right, and they, they didn't have to be dismantled as it had fundamentally happened for, for practical reasons uh, up to up to these points. Um, and um, he, mm, he was in, Bramante was considered the inventor of light, right, and of the good and true uh, architecture um, in many ways. Leonardo da Vinci. Well, I refuse my to try to to introduce uh, this figure on, on a YouTube uh, video because it would be too, you know, uh, mortifying.
for uh, this inventor, artist, in, in science. And, um, and first of all, because I presume that you know who, who, he, who he was, and also because it would take too much time to, to, to define the figure. Um, so we'll, you know, make the thing very, very short. Uh, he can be considered, um, if not D, uh, but hands down, one of the greatest uh, minds uh, and talents uh, at a universal level, like in, in the history of mankind, um, and specifically of within the Renaissance, right? Uh, one of the greatest geniuses of humanity. Uh, he, he was truly the man of his time. Like, if you think about the Renaissance and Leonardo in his character, he is he's embodying it fully, right? And he brought um, the the Renaissance proper as the, the greater forms of expressions in the, the major fields of art and knowledge, right? Art and knowledge always remained this pair because this is what the, the Renaissance actually was and remained. Leonardo was a scientist, philosopher, architect, painter, sculptor, drawer, uh, treatise writer, sonographer, anatomist, botanic, musicist, engineer, uh, you know, project maker. He, um, you know, here we, we can't really uh, connect it to, to anything without descending too to much in, in the detail, but it's a figure, maybe we will try to, to address history of art and of uh, science and of technology at some point, but I would leave it here just for saying this is one of those people you you can't really compare in in, in by by any relative standard like you you um there is something in in leonardo that has has, has traveled across time right just think about his projects m most of which would have absolutely not worked in reality of his times but you know if you think about helicopters tanks uh you know some of the greatest and you know intuitions that would have arrived but not much because of a visionary like he was surely a visionary genius uh, in many ways but but probably because he realized the possibility of it right because the practical you know the, the that's the confidence of the renaissance man it's the idea that this thing is not just you know like a, a caprice like, the thing can't be done it, it, it just just need to take how to do it <laughs> which is a whole different thing and that's where the, the science enters Right, and it's not just art. Um, then another uh, embarrassingly presentable figure for his sheer greatness, Raffaello Sanzio, right, born in uh, in Urbino as well, um, and died in Rome, um, unfortunately young, um, and he was mainly a painter and architect, as you know, of the most famous of the Renaissance, and he is considered as well one of the greatest artists of all times. His work uh, marked a basically um, un unforgettable path for all the later painters. He was of vital importance for the development of a linguistical, um, uh, for, uh, you know, let's say an artistical language for the centuries to come. And he gave life to, to a school that of art that made properly, you know, in Italian it's the maniera, it's it's the manner, it's the way, right, you know, that it was proper of Raffaello himself, and that eventually was known as manierismo, manierism, the idea of this, you know, that developed mostly from the um, uh, later, you know, the, the 16th century, the, the second half of the 16th century takes more form, that is based on this great, on the acknowledgement of this greater generation that had existed at the beginning of the 16th and that will continue on in, in, in neoclassicism at some point um, and uh, he he would remain in fact uh, a model for the academies up to the basically the first half of the 19th century right there are many great artists such as Dali himself you know in the 20th that you know you know in, in its painting that is even inspired to him and this is another great figure. These Venetian figures are also very, very interesting, right? Venice is uh, is a city state, but it has expanded in the northeast of the uh, of the Italian peninsula, uh, 
encompassing all these centers that produced that that had produced like uh, you know, some of the great centers of humanism, think about Padua just for the university and the literary studies. Um, it was, Venice was probably in this time, and for the one to come, also a, a, a very libertine uh, uh, scenery that in Italy, think about even after the Counter-Reformation, I mean, the, the Protestants, the, you know, in England, in other countries that thought that the Venetians were, albeit Catholics, actually honorary Protestants because they had refused the work of the Inquisition in their own land. They were somewhat opened that Venice had this massive printing um, market from which uh, knowledge poured all over all over the continent. Uh, it had this privileged access and contact with the uh, with the East, with the the Greek and uh, Arab manuscripts, uh, and so. And the first figure we're pointing out is Giorgione, or also known as Giorgio da Castelfranco, um, that is a pseudonym of Giorgio Zorzi or Zorzo. Um, he was born in the era of Venice and died in, in Venice. And he was mainly a painter, right? And uh, a, a proper exponent of the Venetian school of paint. And albeit he was very popular in life, he is one of the most enigmatic figures in the history of, of painting, right, you know, because he basically didn't sign any work, and it, it's very dramatic, uh, the, the reconstruction of his own, of his own, you know, creations, right, you know, that there is the difficulty um, from the scholars to actually say, okay, this is really his uh, work, or maybe his school, his followers, his mediators, um, and he was active in Venice as a painter for barely more than 10 years um, and appearing all of a sudden in many ways that, uh, you know, gave a sort of legendary touch even to, to his figure. And even by narrowing down the, the, the this pretty large, actually, amount of works that could be made by him to, to the ones that are just certainly his, his work, um, and one thing, also wishing to resize this, the, the hyperbolis that followed to his, uh, his death when he was glorified in this sense, um, his activity surely gave uh, you know, a major turn, uh, an epochal turn in Venetian painting and um, impressing a decisive turn towards the, the, the modern manner proper. Uh, the nickname, Giorgione, this is just like a uh, like a figure is also like uh, is a majorative, like it probably referred to his uh, great physical um, uh, uh, appearance. Like you know, he was very tall, it, and and he was uh, therefore seen mostly as this mm, you know mysterious figure that you know that that was appeared more like a myth than the, the, rather than a man. All this. Uh, you know, anecdotes on him and, and so on. And it's a bit like his paintings. If you, I like very much Giorgione's paintings. If you ever watch, for example, The Tempest, I've, I've put it in here somewhere, uh, in, in the pictures that are passing by. But there are many others, the, the, the three philosophers, for example, the, uh, the, sleeping, uh, the sleeping Venus, that also with uh, Tiziano, as we will see, will, will have a, a following. Um, the there there are many works for this that are very enigmatic that really uh, transmit the sense of of torment and it, it's really modern inside like it really it really makes you realize that here we are just a step beyond whatever we think the Middle Ages had had produced and it's very enigmatic uh, the the figures in Spain is very you know isolated in this landscapes that are very um, they're loaded with with arcane meaning even with a sort of, um, you know, bucolic character that, that remains quite silent and mysterious and, and enigmatic. It's really great artist who sh should check his work out. Then there is Vittore Carpaccio, and are considered by some as a minor painter, but he actually was one of the most famous uh, of he, uh, you know, in, in Venetian painting, and another Venetian. Um, uh, of, of the same uh, era, and he was actually uh, one of the greatest uh, witnesses of the customs and of the uh, 
extraordinary aspect of the Republic of Venice in this time. But Venice was was blooming in, in this in this time in many ways, in spite of the the greater crisis of the peninsula. There is this contraction. You know, that Venice basically after wars of Italy decides to you know mind just his own maritime business, not to and, and to remain, you know. Uh, idling in, in the middle between the Habsburgs, be between Spain and France, just not to create too much trouble. Um, and he mm, definitely um, had, um, you know, difficulty to, to, to maybe cope with the other great artists of his time, like Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raffaello, and Giorgione and Tiziano, as we'll see now. And it, it's somewhat, uh, in fact, a retro artist for his times, but has definitely uh, lots of admirers still, and I'm surely one of them, there, there were some beautiful, I've never seen the, I inserted in here the portrait of a knight dated to the 1510, all these beautiful pictorial uh, scenes of, of, you know, cross sections of buildings and um, urban views, uh, they're really amazing. There, there is the vision of St. Augustine. Have you ever never seen that? With St. Augustine looks at it from out of, of the window, and there's a little dog watching him. Uh, there is beautiful, uh, another beautiful St. Georgian dragon, um, the dispute of St. Stephen, uh, that Christ, uh, the this other, you know, kind of exoterical um, paintings like the Hunt in the Lagoon and the two Venetian dames. Um, Check him out because once again it's it's kind of underrated in many ways. The other the other guy that is really cool is um, Lorenzo Lotto, right? Italian painter born in Venice proper, and he was one of the greatest um, figures in the Venetian res Renaissance of the early 16th century, and he was very original, anticonformistic. Um, he, for this reason, he was somewhat emarginated from the same Venetian uh, environment, while this was now dominated by Tiziano. And therefore he traveled a lot, and uh, he spread his example in schools that were considered somewhat peripheral from uh, at that time, like for example Bergamo in Lombardy, or in the, in the marches, in fact that's where he died, and his human uh, story is, um, you know, it, it's kind of dramatic. That he f he suffered many setbacks and uh, bitter disappointments um, that, however, have been partially compensated by the revaluation in by modern critics that uh, bring him uh, to be considered one of of the greatest, uh, you know, one of the most modern authors of, of his times, like uh, definitely a suffering, introverted and moody figure, but he made also some of the greatest works you, you can see. There are beautiful self-portraits uh, from him. He was, he was kind of, he was, he was interesting as a, as a figure, right? He, he made uh, several interesting portraits himself, and, and it's another figure we have just named is Tiziano Vecelli, no, simply known as Tiziano, born in, um, you know, in, in the far to the, you know, north of Italy and died in, in, in Venice, he was a painter, citizen of the Republic of Venice and major, ex uh, you know, member of the Venetian school, a figure of the Venetian school and he was uh, essentially a polyedric artist um, an innovator, right? He he was a master together with um, Giorgione of tonalism. It was very important to have to do with uh, you know probably this the Vene Venetian um, artistic technique that was tied to a new and different perception of color, right? That is, um, you know, very different from the Florentine art that had a different. Uh, approach. Um, Tiziano was one of the few Italian painters to own um, a true company of it. He was also a you know, capable entrepreneur and he produced, in fact, painting on, on commission and some, from some of the greatest uh, 
you know, commitments of of the time. And we're talking about, you know, figures like Charles V of Habsburg, of which you have one of the most famous portraits on horseback. I don't know if you've ever seen it, probably. Um, and it's, uh, it's really magnificent. He r renewed, really, uh, painting, um, even as an in an alternative way to Michelangelo himself, right? And having this very most personal um, use of color and uh, the great ab one of the greatest abilities in drawing proper and basically putting together these chromatic areas, right? An opposition of uh, warm and cool uh, colors and this very wise use of light, right? Get give a great unity to the represented seats. Um, Tiziano used the expressive force of material col uh, color and entering uh, eventually during his f uh, full maturity um, in into a, a phase in which he abandoned the balanced uh, sp spatial view. Let's we'll say you know he. Um, assumed uh, a dynamism that is more proper of mannerism, playing with this freedom of uh, chromatic variations, where color was more, you know, sensible to the effects of life and more, you know, more flexible in um, more malleable in, in many ways. Then, having concluded this, we can't talk about um, Michelangelo who was committed together with Raffaello in the enormous and grandiose projects of renewal of papal Rome, right, that, you know, the, 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 the Renaissance capital in the 15th century is Florence, in the 16th century Rome, um, and especially in this first phase before the, the sack of the city, in the renewal of the city after the, the Avignonese uh, phase, so the the popes are are rebuilding the whole city and it it, it gave uh, fortunately life to some of the greatest masterpieces once again in, in the history of Western civilization, um, mainly under uh, Julius the the second Leo the 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 tenth and his successors, think about the Vatican rooms uh, painted by Raphael or the uh, Universal uh, Judgment Stage ju the Judizio Universal. A fresco by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, uh, inaugurated in 1541, um, and it's probably in here that the imitation of the classical models reached the the apex of the original elaborations, right? And properly in 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 the history of Renaissance, because the wars of Italy marked the beginning of the uh, uh, of the final phase of the great uh, Renaissance. Uh, you know, Italian Renaissance season proper, right? Not that Italy will remain at the center in that sense of Europe up to uh, at least the end of the 17th century, cultural superpower throughout all the 18th uh, century, but still, this is the really, uh, the, it's these generations across the, the late 15th and beginning of the 16th century really gave the, the most of all. And Michelangelo is also this other figure that we can't really describing a few words. Um, he, he was born in, in, in Tuscany, in the province of Arezzo, and he was a, fundamentally a sculptor, a, a painter, an architect, and poet. Right? Michelangelo is a, an important name in, in, in literature after all as well. He was definitely protagonist of the Italian Renaissance, to say the least. Um, already in, in, in his lifetime, he was recognized as one of the greatest artists of all time, uh, easily. And he was, uh, uh, you know, a tormented genius, uh, to say the least, a giant, actually, um, in, in, in all senses. Right? He, his name is tied to some of the most majestic works of Western art, um, through which we can name the David, the Moses, the Vatican um, piety, let's say, and the Dome of St. Peter, as well as the frescoes of the Sistine Chapel that we remember before, that are considered as some of the unsurpassable, um, you know, achievements of the creative ingenuity. And 
the setting of his works uh, marked the generations uh, to, to come, giving life, uh, together with other models, to manierism, as, as, as we have said, that owed definitely a lot to Michelangelo's work himself. Um, and um, here, maybe it's interesting to go a little bit back to look at, at Florence once again. I mean, trying to explain a bit why it was this happening. In in uh, in Italy and especially in this cities here. So the easy answer is, as we were saying before, uh, very advanced, rich, populated place, uh, the highest per capita wealth in the world. Frankly, um, uh, this you know major trade involvement, uh, financial involvement all over Europe and the Mediterranean. Um, this internal competition and um, you know peculiar political and institutional uh, character that was dominated mostly by mercantile and nobility elites right that promoted messianism of which definitely florence as we've seen was was the greater beginner of um, florence was the, the most republican of all the italian seigneuries and the medici dynasty promoted messianism that you know is a term that derives from the um, the roman patrician Caius Clinus Mechanus, that um, uh, first century BC, the town of Augustus, was you know protector of uh, the poets Virgil and Horace, and that indicates the usage, very uh, very widespread in this in the Renaissance among the lords, the popes, and the sovereigns to promote the arts, the letters, the sciences through the committance of works and the protection of, of artists and scholars. And at its base, there were, you know, uh, you know, from a strictly artistic point of view, I mean, there were cultural and taste reasons, right? And but also, more uh, important ones, after all, in you know, a broader political and social dimension, it was the research of prestige and consensus, right? Um, the Renaissance art and art in general uh, were part of a world that, as we've seen, were, was very hierarchical, but when we see this l luxury, this um, ostentation of wealth of the Renaissance, of the Baroque, people, I mean, some people usually complain, oh, look at these rich, I don't know, um, popes and cardinals and noblemen, you know, all the people were starving. Absolutely not, because everything of, in this works of art that you see was paid for. Have you got an idea of how much job was given, I don't know, by the, the, the building of St. Peter's Basilica? Do you know who how many people lived under the clientels of these of these figures and how much wealth was actually circular how it was redistributed because it was a fierce competition all the time surely it was not a an extremely um you know meritocratic or uh, cross uh, you know class society in the, in this regard but you know we're talking also about western world in the 16th century in a moment which the, the, the ancien regime had was structuring now exactly the same um, realities that were able to create things like the renaissance the modern state actually a, a better a better quality of life i mean it was a sense sensible improvement across the world I think but um, there weren't many other ways of doing that at the time and, and the Renaissance is the beginning of modernity in this very sense. Um, Florence was definitely the propeller of, of the Renaissance, right, as uh, one of the most important cities in Europe, and um, as in, in a few other places and moments in history, like, you know, take Athens at the time of Pericles or Paris at the end of the 19th century, was concentrated uh, one extraordinary number of artists and intellectual. I mean, it's it's apparently unbelievable if if you think about it. Um, the travel across Europe. There was a probably European dimension of the Renaissance. So we're we're saying that we're talking about at the beginning. I mean, the idea that this is um, the uh, a moment of, of of proper research of a common past of a classical legacy. These scholars were traveling uh, through the the libraries all all over Europe and bringing with them also a lot of knowledge, exchanging manuscripts, speaking with people from other countries and, and building a truly common uh, culture. What do you think Erasmus from Rotterdam gave the name for to, to, to the Erasmus of exchange? Uh, um, 
uh, within the European career, but it, it's fundamentally about this. I mean, the realization that the European intelligentsia has a, a, an, uh, a common identity, right? That, that there is a shared uh, identity all over Europe, and that is, is founded in this, both in this ancient and modern reality, and that has to be regenerated constantly. And um, so, aside from all the, the the people that we have talked about, there is definitely another one that perhaps best incarnated the spirit of the Renaissance, uh, of, of the humanism proper, actually, that is Leon Battista Alberti, right? 1404-1472, it was basically uh, one of the finest men on letters and one of the greatest um, pedagogists, um, the, the, um, you know, theorist of paintings and, and sculpture and one of the greatest architects of his time animated by an extraordinary curiosity for the Roman world that was taken as, as a model and not by imitation but for innovation right, this is important because that's the best of the Renaissance that's not the mere copy but the innovation that indeed the Renaissance, even if not all humanists realize it actually was already that, right? Because in the moment in which certain humanists were trying to recover to revive the classical past, they, had, they, didn't, they didn't know they had already they had already surpassed it um, during medieval times. And Leon Battista Alberti was definitely not just, you know, he, he was one of the greatest polymaths indeed, you know, as an architect and a writer, a mathematician, a humanist, a cryptographer linguist, philosopher, here did all things that uh, come together, right? Florence, even as a center of Neoplatonism, of this borderline, also Gnosticism, in, in, my, in many ways, you know, this idea that there is a, you know, an evident, an exterior reality, and then beyond there is something else that must be deciphered, exoterically speaking, was all this blending of, of concepts. And, in fact, Don Battista Alberti is one of the most polyedric artistical figures of the Renaissance. Um, and uh, Alberti is, is part of the second generation of humanists, right? Um, humanism beginning, in a sense, before the Renaissance. I mean, this depends on how you want to, to, to you know, uh, temporalize that, but um, periodize that. But, you know, um, the, the, the generation coming after Vergerius, Bruni, Bracciolini, uh, Francesco Barbaro, all these fears that had worked a lot, even for a properly literary renewal, right? This is the second phase where, you know, there is much more of a um, intellectual expansion of those boundaries. And in fact, he was interested in most different disciplines. And uh, Alberti's uh, constant interest was perhaps, in fact, the research of rules both theoretical and practical, right, that could guide the work of the artist. And in his works he mentioned some canons, for example, in the De Stato on, on the statue, he exposed the proportions of human body in the De Pictura on the painting, he provided the first definition of mm, scientific perspective and endly in the Re uh, Edificatorio, so, in, you know, basically in the, in the matters of, you know, building and construction, um, um, he mm, that uh, it was a work that he uh, he he worked at actually up to to his death in 1472. He described all the mm, cases fundamentally relative to modern architecture. So this is a very important source for us, um, underlying the importance of the project as we've seen also from previous figures. Uh, that I, I mean actually later figures and in fact drew him you know so from his. Um, the importance of project and different typologies of buildings according to their own function. And this work would actually render him immortal in the centuries. And um, for this reason, he was studied at an international level by artists of the caliber of uh, Eugène Violet le Duc, for example, or John Ruskin. As an, an architect, Alberti is considered, together with Brunelleschi, in fact, the founder of Renaissance architecture. And the innovative character of his proposals, especially uh, in uh, you know in architectonic and humanistic field, consistent in the elaboration, modern elaboration, the innovation proper of of the ancient, as we have seen. So not as just as a model to emulate, 
um, uh, but probably to improve, right? Not not a mere a mere replica, right? And uh, he was definitely part of this kind of enlightened bourgeoisie that is typical of the the Florentine, um, you know, institutional culture in some ways. It was an ar an aristocracy at the end of the day, but you know. Uh, he also worked with other under other regimes, other than the Medici, for example, with the Gonzaga in Mantua, for the tribunal of the uh, of the Holy um, Annunziata in, in Florence, the um, uh, and also the Malatesta uh, of Rimini, and also this other Flor local uh, family, the Rucellai, who was one of the most famous in Florence, as well. And as we've seen, uh, this was the same period of um, which in Florence Filippo Brunelleschi guided between 1420 and 1436 the construction site of the great dome of the cathedral of um, St. Mary of the Flowers, the, the, the Florence dome, resolving the technical problems that uh, they had actually prevented its building since the previous century, which is particularly interesting. That was actually the great century of uh, well here now it's complicated maybe to sell the story but you know the idea that that there had been with the crisis of the 14th century sort of stop even to this greater you know building especially cathedrals you know that most you know many European cathedrals were started in this phase of extreme uh, wealth but during the 13th century with with the 14th century the the constructions they lasted generations as buildings that they were stopped at some cathedrals were finished in in the 19th century and uh, the bell towers for example and so on and Brunelleschi basing himself on this rigorous mathematical calculations and thanks to the stratagem of building two superimposed domes right the dome was you know bolted like he he created his vault this um, without a properly you know internal skeleton Right, he he just superimposed this two structure, so reaching a height that was, as a consequence, um, uh, you know, even double the diameter. So it was like a great compact structure, basing itself on its within itself. Right, and this was a genial realization that uh, in which we're blending essentially both scientific reasoning and artistical intuition. And let's let's end this video with a with a brief reflection on the work of the artist um, that for 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 a long time in the previous centuries had remained within the you know fundamentally within the artisan craft right you know the artifacts right so he who makes art literally um, was the current term through which was indicated the painter right and his work was. Uh, paid in the same way of a manual labor, uh, even if it was a li luxury one. So during the 15th century, however, there is this change, uh, transformation in the figure of the artist proper that was detached now by the relatively modest consideration that it enjoyed, maybe just at a local level. I mean, there, there were, you know, popular artists in cities, etc. But, you know, um, here now we have seen that there is probably an intellectual step forward, right? You know, that, uh, that makes the artist approach into the status of the humanist intellectual. So, with all the figures that we have listed before, we have proven how painters, sculptors, architects didn't feel anymore confined within the limits of their own art and that they dedicated to culture in the widest sense, like to letters in mathematics, arithmetic, astronomy, right, etc. And for this way, between the 15th and 16th century, we assist to a general um, social revaluation of the artist, right, both for the admiration that naturally the works uh, generated, but also for the imposing uh, compensations that were corresponded for, for their own creation, right, the commission here, the clienterly market of the of the, the Italian signories that are some of the most, some of the wealthiest, most cultured uh, mm, polities in, in in the world, right here, really uh, create uh, on on a on a on a wide scale 
right? This is the importance of the fact, even just that this was there was not just a single center, there were many centers. They're all produced, they all were in competition, and they were all in contact with each other. Right? Never make the, the mistake of considering the past, a time in which people didn't travel, that, that news traveled, you know, slowly, or people didn't know. Uh, this was all interconnected since centuries and centuries, right? Um, and uh, uh, Raffaello Tiziano and other heads of school that working for the sovereigns actually, all, all, not just of Italy, but of Europe at that point, as we've seen, um, and also for the Roman Curia, by the way, received enormous riches. Right, together with titles and offices that they actually uh, uh, used to, to ennoble their own families. Right? So this competition was important because naturally, as we've seen before, there was all this uh, homeless of, um, you know, of lots of these people. Who knows how many artists we have missed simply because they were not financed in that regard during the Renaissance. And mm, so this is the interesting side of the story that that also we should consider when we look at the renaissance is that aside from the the, the visual like the the exterior face of it um there was uh, an anonymous world of artisans of craftsmen right from which the artist now was raised but leaving behind lots of others of, of, of whom we know basically nothing uh, unfortunately um and that uh, this artist became uh, a character with that we know not just because of his work but also of his individuality like we can't trace in the Renaissance what the you know what the theory what the sensitivity what the intelligence what the the taste the the, the personal drama right um, the life experience actually was you of this strongly creative uh, figures right so sometimes genial once, as we we have seen this constant anomalous concentration right there was hardly a, a time in history where there was this dramatic concentration of, 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 of minds like genial minds like this and that brought fame to, to themselves uh, in, in within the system so maybe for today we can stop here and as always, I, I, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.